Now, with all this talk about that innovation is nothing else than the recombination of things, you might have already asked yourself, well, is it then just an innovation if I just take anything and just recombine anything? For example, I take a vacuum cleaner and combine it with a tango dancing robot and I would have a tango dancing vacuum cleaner. That Would that be then an innovation? Well, Schumpeter, the very same prophet of innovation, that's how they call him, who gave us the definition of innovation as new combinations, he also added a little more subtle distinction. And he said, inventions are new combinations in the realm of technological possibilities. So my tango dancing vacuum cleaner would be an invention. But then Schumpeter said, an innovation it would only be if this new combination also applies to the realm of economic possibilities. That's just how economists define it nowadays. And that means if I couldn't sell my tango dancing vacuum cleaner, it would be an invention and I could patent it, but it will not count as an innovation in a sense that economists use it nowadays. So there's a distinction. Not all inventions become innovations. And not all innovations also get widely diffused. That's another very subtle point. So you might have an innovation, but if it really becomes the standard, that is a different question. So just as a footnote, innovations are there for they're derived from inventions by entrepreneurs and managers with profit in mind. They're in the realm of economic possibilities. Innovations are also not random. They are shaped by the context of so prices, regulation, institutions, and the perception of it. And innovations are path dependent. So the market de potential often depends on what the market already has accepted. So if nobody's used to tango dancing vacuum cleaners, maybe it won't get accepted even so it might be a genius invention. So there is a distinction right there. And this distinction actually is closely tied to a discussion we already had about technological determinism, whereas people say, well, this kind of technology inevitably has this kind of outcome. Well, actually, if you think about that, not all technology is also then accepted as an innovation. That means that we can choose, we also can shape technology, not only in an engineering sense, but in an economic sense, in a sense that we might accept it or might not accept it. We might value it highly and pay a price for it or not. So with that, we select. For example, in this picture here, you might clearly say, well, of course, that's a bike. That's what a bike looks like. But be assured that people not all, always agreed on what bikes actually look like. So at the beginning, some people might say, well, this is a bike. And other people might say, no, 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 a bike that, that looks like this. And other people say, well, no, bikes, they, they, they look like this. And actually then we socially constructed, we chose which kind of bike we actually also wanted, which became the standard and which we now a day is refer to as the technology we know as bike. So technology is socially constructed. So if we consider this logic of diffusion, of selective diffusion, additionally to the logic of technological progress, we get actually a three-dimensional graph, whereas we have time going on and then we have performance. Technology always gets better, but also technology diffuses while it gets better. It diffuses through social networks, through society. So we get this kind of three-dimensional logic. And there's a very interesting relation between the diffusion of technology and the performance of the technology. This here, for example, in this graph, we have the yearly assessment of aircraft technology. And on the vertical y-axis, we have the performance variable. I basically took here, I took how fast it is and multiplied it by the seating capacity. So this is this combined performance. And on the horizontal x-axis, I have the diffusion indicator. That means how many aircrafts are actually in service and how far do they fly. So on the one is, we have the question, do aircrafts get better? And on the other axis, we have, do aircrafts actually get used a lot? And we see a very interesting logic. For example, we see that when diffusion happens, that means once the indicator moves to the right, we see that it doesn't go up a lot. And at the moments when it goes up, 
be it in the early years or the later years, uh, it doesn't diffuse a lot. So there's a trade-off between diffusion and performance. These two times when it goes up, the first time has to do with the introduction of the propeller. And think about it. Once it was innovated on the introduction of the propeller, um, not a lot of airplanes could be sold at that moment because actually there was such a quick technological change happened. Actually, nobody knew actually what the propeller airplane would look like. But once we settled on a standard, well, then propeller airplanes were sold. Uh, across the world and they flew a lot of miles. Then the jet engine was introduced. At the beginning as well, the performance increased a lot during this time. However, you couldn't really sell a lot of jet engines. Nobody knew what they were about, what's the standard, if they would work. So we had a lot of technological progress, but not a lot of diffusion. So there's a trade-off. There are times where technology improves. And there's a time where technology diffuses, where it gets sold. So there's, you could also say like this, there's a time for the engineers and there's a time for the business people to sell it. And we often find this kind of trade-off. Now, this is the same kind of graph, a graph in the same spirit as the previous graph, but with regard to locomotive technology. And you find something very interesting. Uh, locomotives always became better over time in some sense, but the diffusion at one critical point started to return quickly. Actually, locomotives were not used as much anymore. Well, because they were replaced, cars were introduced and locomotives were not running as many miles anymore and there were not so many locomotives in service anymore. So that has to do with the fact that technology can also die. And that's a very important point. I said technology always becomes exponentially better and increases. Then we were talking about technology as the family of technologies that exponentially increases and always becomes better. But that doesn't mean that a particular standardized solution to a typical need, which is derived from knowledge about the world and embedded into a physical structure, cannot die out. For example, here we have another example of the newspaper. You can see that basically the newspaper as a one kind of solution to a typical need was print news on a piece of paper seems to have stagnated and might probably die out being replaced by equivalent new solutions that address the uh, same typical need, for example, tablets or, or whatever, wherever we read our news nowadays. So specific technologies can die out. The family of all kinds of technologies, that's what exponentially is increasing. And very interesting, as a last point, as a kind of like footnote, there are interesting dynamics. So once you get down to studying technology, the evolution of technology and its diffusion, you find interesting patterns and trade-offs between also the, the advancement and the death of a technology and its diffusion. Here, for example, what I uh, listed here is the units of audio cassettes that were sold in the world. You can see in the blue line, these are the developed countries rich countries, and the red line are developing countries. And you can see that the number of audio cassettes in the developed world peaked in 1988. And from then on, audio cassettes went down. They were replaced by CDs. However, it con the audio cassettes continue to be diffused in developing countries. One of the reasons being that once they were replaced in the developed world, audio cassettes became incredibly cheap and developing countries were able to buy them. The other reason is also at the same time, obviously, audio cassettes producers simply dump them on developing countries. You can also uh, formulate it like this. Um, but you can see that as a result of that, there's a technological lag between the developed countries and the developing countries. You could have had as well a technological strategy where you said, well, in developing countries, all this money that we will now spend on audio cassettes, let's just save that and buy CD players right away. The strategy is known as leapfrogging strategy. So once you understand about the evolution of technology and that it goes in these discrete jumps and always continues, you can design policies 
for example, technological leapfrogging policies, where you say, well, we already know there is a new wave of technology coming. Why don't we as a society just save our money and skip this technology, leapfrog to the technological frontier, and with that, try to catch up? So all kind of interesting policies arise from that. And in the United Nations Secretariat, I was working in many of these policies. And it all starts with the basic theory of how technology evolves, and that's what we were talking about today. But of course, I know that was a lot already. So, so, so wait, so, so wait, so how does technology evolve? Well, we said there are two fundamental characteristics. It is a nature of exponential progress based on combinatorics, and it goes in discrete jumps between continuous and disruptive innovation. And the result is this picture, a picture that we started with, and that's how technology evolves. By the way, this is very similar to how nature also evolves. Natural evolution also goes in this exponential discrete jumps. They call it punctuated equilibrium. So there are some periods where a species evolves quite slowly and you can still see, well, that's kind of like the same species. And then there are these discrete jumps where the wolf converts into the dog. And then the dog becomes bigger and bigger, there's continuous evolution. And then again, there's these discrete jumps. So also nature evolves in a very similar way. Technology evolves.